we will begin chapter four of Barry and the Boys, the CIA, the Mob, and America's Secret History by Daniel Hopsicker. Who is David Perry? No, none of the vast array of mysterious and enigm enigmatic characters surrounding the assassination of President John Kennedy has been as consistently described as mysterious and enigmatic as David Ferry. His life is uniformly described as being full of strange activity and puzzling behavior. Cuban exiles christened him the master of intrigue. The New Orleans DA Jim Garrison called him one of history's most important individuals. At the time of the Kennedy hit, Ferry was 45 years old, New Orleans resident, well acquainted with all of the most notorious names linked to the assassination, Lee Oswald, Clay Shaw, Guy Bannister, Jack Ruby, and Carlos Marcello. According to Bannister, Lieutenant Joe Newbro, he had many other talents as well. Barry spoke fluent Italian and Greek, Newsboro told us. He flew to Italy on several occasions, I can recall, on arms deals, I think. Hmm, arms dealers speaks Italian. Ferry's assorted talents and eccentricities included being a hypnotist, medical researcher, amateur psychologist, victim of a strange disease, al alopecia, which made his body completely hairless, a senior pilot with Eastern Airlines until he was fired for homosexual activity on the job. Homos. He is also described as a CIA contact pilot, which is only accurate if Babe Ruth was a New York Yankee contract baseball player. Barry Seal was also, also Barry Seal will also be tagged with this label when the CIA gets caught with its hands in the multi-billion dollar cocaine cookie jar. Seal is dismissed as a CIA contract pilot who did the bad stuff on his own time or on the side or while the real agents were looking the other way, though the cocaine blizzard which eventually surrounded him on all sides must have made finding another way to look somewhat difficult. In addition to both being labeled CIA contract pilots, Seal and Fer Ferry share similarities, too numerous to be coincidence. This is not really surprising. Both held at different times the same job, Southern Regional Manager, Aircraft Procurement and Deployment, so if they are operating out of the same playbook, the same company manual, maybe, maybe we can deduce a few hints on domestic disinfo. We noted with surprise that it was not that difficult to discover new information about the much written about ferry. Facts both important and trivial. He was called Dave and not David for example by everyone we interviewed who had known him. A little poking around in New Orleans revealed ample evidence that Ferry had Ferry spent his lifetime in America in American clandestine services. Maybe make that contract clandestine services just to be safe. Since it was Ferry who set a young Barry Seal on his path to spookdom we wondered how Ferry himself had been recruited. No one had been able to find out, and while dark side recruitment officers don't leave behind a paper trail with mundane details like date of employment application, we were able, with a little digging, to discover when and how Ferry's spook career began. David Ferry was born in Cleveland in 1918 to a family which made their careers in public service. His father was a police officer who rose to the rank of captain, his uncle a battalion chief in the Cleveland Fire Department. Fire David was reared a Roman Catholic and attended parochial schools until entering Cleveland's St. Mary's Seminary at the age of 20 to prepare for a lifetime of service to the Roman Catholic Church as a priest.
Maybe that's why he's a homo. However, the irrepressible fairy was unable to disguise his lust for altar boys long enough to don the purple vestments. He was judged unsuited temp temperamentally for the role of priest by two separate Catholic seminaries. Fair fairy that began to learn to fly at his father's suggestion to take his mind off his failures at the seminary, according to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the HSCA's investigation states without even a raised eyebrow that Ferry had become, become a pilot in 1942 and then gone to work for an oil drilling firm which had jobs in South America. We found this highly curious. Ferry, 23 in 1942, prime draft age in the middle of World War II, at a time when you needed more than a note from your local congressman to evade military duty. He's a pilot to boot. But instead of being drafted, the HSCA report black blandly states, he goes to work for an oil drilling firm with interests in South America. The oil business has certainly produced more than its share of spooks, Oil and intelligence work seemingly hand in hand, hand in glove. Witnesses, for example, the two George Bushes and George George de Mornschild, Lee Oswald, CIA babysitter in Dallas. Both of them, strangely enough, worked in the oil business in Latin America. Yes, no one has questioned David Ferry's utterly transparent cover story before. And the biggest question this brings up has nothing to do with David Ferry. It has to do with us. He, have we always been such sheep? Our suspicion about David Ferry's entry into American intelligence were confirmed by, ter by Ferry's own godson, Morris Brownlee, in an interview about a man he still remembers fondly. Brownlee was one of America's first beatniks, a mystic when even Unitarians were frowned on, and a student of philosophy who recently in his mid-fifties graduated from college. Back in World War II, the development of South American oil resources was a high priority item for the Nazis, he told us. Remember, they had no oil of their own. The U.S. had a preemptive match for its mission into Sandinista, Nicaragua at Rickenbacker Air Force Base, Small World. As we began to delve into the life of David Ferry, clues to his checkered career as a spook were visible all around, but some came from sources considered less sporting than others. His fellow spooks, former aide to the deputy director of the CIA, Victor Marchetti, was told by a CIA colleague that Ferry had been a contact agent to the agency in the early 60s and had been involved in some of the Cuban activities. Marchetti was convicted, convinced that Ferry was a CIA contract officer and involved in very various criminal activities, telling author Anthony Summers that he observed consternation on the part of the then CIA director, director Richard Helms and other senior officials when Ferry's name was first publicly linked with the assassination in 1967. But because the boys in trench coats exude such a smug George W. Bush-like actually sense of their own superior intelligence, it is far more fun as well as more sporting to find civilian witnesses. We found Eddie Shearer, one of Ferry's cadet disciples in the late 1950s and early 60s, who had much to say about David Ferry. For example, Shearer spent the time in gas stations which Carlos Marcello gave Ferry right after the Kennedy assassination. Many writers, no doubt, afflicted with overactive imaginations, believed the station was a payoff for Ferry's role in the hit. There has never been any doubt in my mind that Dave's gas station, a golf station out of, out on Airline Highway, 
was a CIA cover. He told us some people I knew pretty well hung out there. And it was the funniest thing. If you drove in to fill up with gasoline, which is what a gas station is supposed to be for, right? You could sit in your car forever waiting for someone to come out and tell you they were closed or something. Whatever they were doing there, whatever they were doing there, pumping gas wasn't it. Much maligned New Orleans DA Jim Garrison apparently noticed the same thing. Although Ferry, to all intents and purposes, was unemployed at the time, he said in Heritage of Stone, an examination of his bank account revealed that during the three-week period to the president's assassination, he deposited $7,093.02. Then, a few months after the assassination, Ferry suddenly acquired a large service station. He apparently ran it in much the same way he maintained his apartment. On one occasion, he had just filled the gas tank of an acquaintance, and he waved him away, turning down payment for the gas. Forget it, he said. The government's paying for it anyway. Barry Seal, like David Ferry, will also own a gas station among a dozen small businesses in the 60s and 70s. One of the most revealing insights we received about SEAL came from someone from military intelligence who had known him in the 60s. We had spent several weeks looking through boxes of business receipts from SEAL's various enterprises before we asked this man for an explanation of some of the nuance nuances of covert operations. Is an agent like Seal primarily a small business owner and suburban father, someone who gets a call to do something for the boys one or two days a month, we asked him. That's not how it works, explained this Intel veteran, smiling at our naivety. Cover was very important in the 60s and 70s. In the 80s, things got sloppy and it became less important. But back when you were talking about your cover was very important. So we asked incredulously, still distracted with thoughts of seal, seals and fairies, contract pilot status. Do you mean seal was a full-time CIA guy whose various businesses, businesses were just cover? His answer was a matter of fact, yes. And so it was with David Ferry, who, in addition to his pilot duties, also conducted wide-ranging and bizarre experiments at the same exact time the CIA has admitted doing freaky CIA mind control MK Ultra research. Out back of Ferry's house, he had a workshop in his backyard, Ed Shearer told us, and I know this sounds weird, but he had a skull out there hooked up to a skeleton and to simulate a nervous system. He had used different colored electrical wire, blue, red, and green, in an effort to understand the human's physiology. Dave was a brilliant individual interested in all kinds of things, continued Shearer, who related how Ferry's mother, whom he knew from visiting Ferry, had told him that Dave's brother was a nuclear physicist. When we tracked down Ferry's brother, the nuclear physicist living in California, he was unwilling to talk. Nuclear physicists are notoriously smart. There were almost constant examples of David Ferry's brilliance when you hung around with him, said Shearer. He had a little lawnmower just to give you one for instance that he couldn't get to start. So I was out back one day repeatedly pulling on the little rope to get it started while he watched. What a waste of efficiency, Dave mused out loud. If we could only get rotary motion from a motor at the start. Remember, this was years before the rotary engine was patented before anyone had ever heard of a Wankel motor. But Dave had had the same idea just talking out loud. Like many in New Orleans, Shearer was accustomed to seeing Ferry at the airport in the company of Sergio Arachna Smith, 
the Cuban Revolutionary Front leader for whom he, Ferry, was training exile pilots. There were a lot of things about Dave that just didn't fit unless you added them up another way, he says today. Just his appearance, good God, you have to wonder how Eastern You have to wonder how Eastern was able to keep him as long as they did. I remember him taxiing his Eastern Convair one time on his weekday Houston New Orleans milk run. He would always pull in way faster than any other airline pilots did, and he'd be leaning out of one side of his cockpit window, looking like some damn railroad engineer or something. Then two weekends every month, Dave flew a constellation up to Washington, D.C. and back. And if while he was up there, he was meeting with CIA contacts, it would make sense because I was with him on three or four occasions when he returned. And when he opened his wallet, I noticed he had several $100 bills. That doesn't seem very extraordinary, we replied. He was a pilot at Eastern, and they made decent money, didn't they? you got to remember, this was in the 50s, Shearer stated. Anyone who was working back then can tell you, you got paid in 20s. Nobody got paid in $100 bills back then. You hardly ever saw $100 bills. Shearer got conclusive proof of Ferry's career in clandestine services less than five years after Ferry's death. In 1972, I was asked to join the Senior Civil Air Patrol, an outfit with no cadets, Shearer relates. There I met Herb Wagner, a Navy flyer in World War II, who had then been recruited by OSS, the CIA's precursor, at the end of the war. When we got friendly, I'd go over to his house and sometimes he would reminisce about things he'd done for the CIA back in the mid-50s. Herb told me, once you're in the CIA, it's hard to get out. He tried to get out when he got married to, and settled down. He and his wife had adopted a baby daughter and he wasn't the daredevil he once had been, but they still pressured him to fly. She said, sure. I visited him one time just after he'd gotten a visit from the CIA to go do something he no longer really wanted to be doing, quite obviously because he was really down when I talked with him. And that was when he loosened up and told me about David Ferry, saying that if the truth was ever known about Dave Ferry, he would be recognized as one of the true unsung heroes of the United States, and this was coming from a man who did not hand out praise real easily. And that's when I realized that Ferry had been a regular CIA guy, not just some asset or counteroperative. Confirmation of Ferry's status often came in casual conversation with pilots who had worked in New Orleans. I first met David Ferry out at Lakefront Airport in 1965, Pilot James Poach told us he was running a fixed, based, fixed base operation with five DC-3s and some PBYs. That is quite a little feat of planes Ferry is handing out of the CIA's FBO fixed base operations in New Orleans. By 1972, five years after Ferry had been suicided, his protege SEAL will be using, according to transcripts of SEAL's 1972 trial for exporting munitions, the same fleet of the DC-3s and PBYs which David Ferry had controlled. Just how much can a CIA agent get away with in America? Would you believe child molestation? Oh yeah. Just how much can a CIA agent get away with in America? Okay, I've read that. David Ferry was arrested in New Orleans on August 8, 1961 for contributing to the delinquency of a juvenile and re-arrested three days later for extortion, engaging in homosexual behavior with a 15-year-old boy, 
and indecent behavior with three others. The extortion charge reported the New Orleans time pick I, pick a on August 29, 1961, was related to a 16-year-old who had made statements to police that Ferry showed up at the grocery store where he worked, threatening the youth into signing papers stating he would not press the crime of nature charge in the case. What has never been told is what happened after David Ferry was arrested. The cops who had executed the warrant, when authorities with the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office entered Ferry's home with a search warrant on August 22, 1961, they found munitions, maps of the Cuban Coast Rifle, rif maps of the Cuban Coast Rifles, ammunition and two miniature submarines later used to infiltrate CIA operatives into Cuba. An FBI report a year later stated that the Cuban Revolutionary Council, of which Ferry was a co-founder and leader, gave one Jose Rabel a highly sophisticated assassination weapon and sent him into Cuba a, via a CIA-supplied submarine. Anyone busted on a morals charge should be as lucky as Ferry was. He had an OJ-like dream defense team, consisting of such legal luminaries as Kennedy, Kennedy assassination suspect and FBI-slash-CIA-slash-ONI, Office of Naval Investigation, made Guy Bannister, and his attorney, G. Ray Gill who spent most days toiling as Mafia Kingfish, Carlos Marcello's main attorney. Guy Bannister will come up again later in 1972 in connection with Barry Seal's munition trial. On trial with Seal was New York mobster Murray Kessler, who authorities assumed had met Seal when both worked for Bannister in the early 1960s. We interviewed the police officers who executed the search warrant and arrested David Ferry on morals charges back in 1961 and discovered that no, that no one until now had talked to them about what both considered the most bizarre experience of their law enforcement career. When Ferry was arrested, both according to both their accounts, all hell broke loose. Former Sergeant Ronald Foreigner of the New Orleans PD shakes his head in disbelief today at what transpired. It started out as just a regular arrest. We were receiving complaints from parents that Ferry was taking good kids and corrupting them, getting them to break into gun rooms of high schools and steal guns because he was into gun running to the Cubans. We also had complaints that he would sit with the kids, sit around in a room, and masturbate in a circle jerk. I guess you would call it stated foreigner. I guess you would call it stated foreigner. Barry was the great imposter, he continued. He could be just about anything he needed to be under the circumstances, like treating the kids medically as if he were a doctor, which he did. He had a card identifying himself as a doctor, which is kind of funny since he looked like he had moss from a tree glued to his scalp. So we raided his house. We knew he was carrying on sexually with the children, but good lord what we found. We found maps, guns, high school official Air Force recruiting films, books on the occult, and hypnotism lying around and chalices and other instruments used in, ma used in mass. And then the next day, to our shock, Foreigner continued, we discovered that warrants had been issued for our arrest. My partner and myself, the cops who had executed the search warrant, Ferry had gone to a judge and gotten warrants issued. Nothing like it had ever happened before, and that's when it all began to be a little bit intimidating, frankly. Charles Jonu, foreigner's partner in the New Orleans Police Department, search of Ferry's premises in 1961 agreed with this account and offered something else. I handled surveillance on Ferry for Garrison later, he told us. Garrison was on this guy like rice on gravy. 
I'd watch Ferry pacing around his apartment nude, smoking one cigarette after another. That's what he'd do. Pace and smoke. It was strange to watch the guy do that. Ferry would talk to you like he was a friend of yours, but I was never fooled. I knew he'd stab you in the back as easy as look at you. After Ferry's arrest, a bizarre series of negotiations began regarding the charges against him. We were trying to get these runaway kids away from him and return them to their parents, and we began to get phone calls setting up meetings held under mysterious circumstances with Cubans in khakis who said they would produce the kids if and only if Ferry was not prosecuted, stated Foreigner. This story of almost state to state negotiations is too similar to be mere coincidence to the incredible offer which the Louisiana State Police will make to Barry Seal 20 years later in 1981 when they implore him to move his drug smuggling operation out of their state and in return they will cease efforts to indict him for crimes he had already committed he has already committed it was most generous it was the most generous offer i ever heard made to a criminal says one cop who was there but instead of accepting gratefully barry's response was that he would have to first check with his people almost 40 years later foreigner is still amazed that still amazed at the hornet's nest stirred up by fairy's arrest there I was. I'm just doing my job and some strong, high-powered organization is getting a warrant issued for my arrest. And the thought occurred, I'm dealing with some awfully high-level Cubans here. This Captain Ferry, someone here, has a lot of pull. This guy is a powerful man with a lot of powerful friends. Powerful enough to get charges dismissed? You bet. Morris Brownlee told us how it happened. I led a small informational delegation of influential citizens to visit the Jefferson Parish DA to persuade him to drop the charges. Included were Father Mullaby from Loyola, myself, and Herb Wagner. He went to tell him about all the good things David Ferry had done. And though the process was a bloody mess, both because both New or because both Orleans and Jefferson parishes had filed charges against him, we were eventually successful and the charges were dropped. Could this be the same Herb Wagner who Eddie Scher had told us about? OSS and CIA pilot Herb Wagner, we asked. You knew him, Brownlee replied unruffled. Perhaps it's just a co perhaps it's just coincidence. But this is not the last time in our story in which the Jesuits who ran Loyola will figure Seal's longtime CIA handler, Dave Dixon, had had close ties to Loyola University, New Orleans, and its president, Bernard P. Knopf, S.J. So, SJ so hearing about the intercession of the church on behalf of a man charged with child molestation led us to wonder if there might some institutional connection brought to bear. Later, a former high-ranking official from the National Security Agency would tell us that it had been no mistake that Manuel Noriega had sought refuge in the Vatican's embassy during the American invasion of Panama since Noriega had been the Vatican's boy. Former New Orleans police sergeant Foreigner shakes his head in disgust at the memory of his 61 debacle. The whole thing was out of this world, and then, the night of the president's death, we began to get phone calls from the DA's office about Ferry. When he got caught up in Garrison's probe, None of us believed Ferry committed suicide or died of natural causes. He was, remember, in flight condition. He had to be he had to be to pass his annual physical. How much better does it get? Charles Jonu, who had been surveilling Ferry the night he died, concurred. <laughs> 
While CIA recruiter David Ferry is usually described as rabidly anti-Castro and anti-communist, this is not altogether correct. Ferry had also run guns to his idol in the 50s, Fidel Castro, when the Cuban revolutionary was raiding Batista's forces from the Sierra Maestra. As reported by two New Orleans reporters on the scene, Jack Warlaw and Rosemary James, in their book Counterplot, according to a Captain Neville Levy, Ferry was engaged in gun smuggling to Fidel Castro and raising money for his 26th of July movement. Ferry even went so far as to carry a loaded gun while funding for Fidel, Levy said. No evidence of this appears in Ferry's FBI file. But then neither do records exist today of Ferry Seal's own arrest for weapons smuggling into Cuba. We found several early friends of Seal's who confirmed and expanded on the story we had first heard from Joe Nettles. Barry got busted with a plane load of weapons in the tiny town of Longview, Texas, located halfway between Dallas and Shreveport, stated Reggie Griffith, a man who knew Seal his entire adult life. Griffith, who had the Piper Airplane distributorship in Baton Rouge, ruefully recalls the way things were in the pilot fraternity in Louisiana in those early feverish days of the secret war with Cuba. One time I rented a brand new Aztec twin engine airplane to a man named Matthew Edward Duke at right about the time Barry was busted in Texas, Griffith states. I did it after getting a phone call from an aircraft dealer in Houston, J.D. Reed. Duke was an ex-commander in the Army Air Corps, and said he'd be back to, and he said he'd be back a little after dark. Two or three days later, this guy Duke calls up long distance, says he's down in Cuba, and can he keep the plane for a few more days till Monday? Well, what am I going to say? Monday morning rolls around, and the border patrol shows up, telling me my plane had just been shot down over Cuba. The pilot was dead, and what did I know about it? Griffith pauses. What I knew about it was nothing, but what I was about to know about it was that my insurance company was only going to compensate me $10,000 on a $92,000 plane. Reggie Griffith had made, in other words, an unintended $80,000 contribution to the cause. Numerous inquiries about Seal, Seal's expunged weapon smuggling arrest in Longview, Texas, yielded an interesting glimpse into the problems associated with bringing to light matters some people prefer were left in the dark. We called around to find out if there was a local newspaper in that tiny Texas town between Shreveport and Dallas, which might have some record of the arrest, only to be told by the local librarian don't even bother calling the local paper a lot of things which happened in this town never really happened if you know what i mean then we got a little lucky longview texas has a law library we discovered and the librarian was a friend of the 80 year old judge who was oh jesus oof, who was the only sitting jurist at the time she checked with this man, Judge Atkinson, who recalled the incident if vaguely, but was unable or unwilling to say more. Now intrigued, the law librarian emailed a cousin who had worked in national security in the White House under two presidents, she told us, asking him if he knew Barry, if he knew of Barry Seal. Yes, I do, but that's all I can say, came his terse reply. The official story about David Ferry states that when Castro announced he had become a Marxist. Ferry furiously turned against his former idol and began to pilot bombing missions into Cuba, as well as sabotage raids on behalf of various Cuban exile groups, as if the CIA's changing attitude towards all things Fidelismo has had nothing to do with the headstrong Dave's sudden change of heart. 
1961, well before the Bay of Pigs, Ferry flew to Cuba dozens of times, sometimes on bombing missions, sometimes making daring landings to extract anti-Castro resistance fighters. Anthony Summers in Conspiracy states it was rumored that he had piloted Oswald to Cuba in 1959. But true to CIA's tactics of denying the obvious until things die down, Ferry even claimed he had never even been to Cuba, but he regularly boasted of his exploits there, regaling his more trusted young CAP admirers. Like Eddie Shearer, with tales of his activities as a commando spy at the Bay of Pigs, Ferry often told a story of how he had been knifed in the belly by a Castro militiaman during a midnight hit and run mission to the coast of Cuba in early 1961, when he died on the eve of being called to testify to Garrison's grand jury, Garrison related in On a Trail of Assassins, one of numerous legends about David Ferry and his adventures as a soldier of fortune pilot involved a takeoff involved a takeoff he made from the Escambre Mountains in Cuba after delivering munitions to the anti-Castro rebels operating there. As the legend went, a counterattack had almost trapped him, and he was forced to take off in his plane while fighting one, Castro, one of Castro's soldiers with his free hand. He had, according to this tale, received a bad stab wound in his stomach before he got the plane off the ground. When Lou Ivon, a garrison investigator, returned from the morgue, he was holding a freshly taken photograph. The dead man on the slab, his bald head and aristocratic profile, somewhat suggestive of Julius Caesar, Caesar, bore the scar of a knife wound running up the center of his stomach. So much for never having been in Cuba, an airline pilot we met who f had flown with Ferry went even further. They, Fidel's boys, were looking for Ferry, and that's a fact. The first communist Cuban hijacking of a plane was an eastern plane on Ferry's normal run. They took an eastern plane to Havana that Ferry would normally have been piloting, but for some mysterious reason, he wasn't there that day. But there is one subject concerning David Ferry which seems at first glance to be so unbelievable, so akin to dead Elvis sightings, that we were highly skeptical when we first heard of it. But after we received first-hand eyewitness testimony on this topic, delivered so matter-of-factly as to be utterly believable, we are convinced of its importance. If the many controversies swirling around David Ferry's life, like the one about whether he was attempting to induce cancer in lab mice kept in cages in his apartment, None is fringier than Ferry's supposed talent for hypnotism, but the evidence for this is not merely persuasive, it is overwhelming. Even so, we would not believe it had we not heard unsolicited testimony about Ferry's preoccupation with hypnotism and his ability to hypnotize people. Almost immediately... After the assassination, stories began starting with alcoholic Jack Martin, who in his first investigation interview suggested that Oswald had been put into a hypnotic trance state by Ferry, who then imposed a post-hypnotic order to go to Dallas and kill the president. Martin, strangely enough, never rec recanted this story and never told federal investigators that his first story was untrue and since manifested tremendous apprehension when Ferry died, expressing fear for his own life and, fleeting, and fleeing New Orleans for some time. Maybe he was telling the truth. One could easily dismiss, dismiss this claim if it stood alone. It sounds like it originated somewhere just slightly west of Area 51, but there are Freedom of Information Act documents released on the CIA's MK Ultra Mind Control experiments, which state that several Cuban immigrants were found upon whom hypnosis was tried. 
with apparent goal of planting an agent in Cuba who, when triggered, would kill Fidel Castro, Ferry is the likeliest candidate to have been doing the programming. The CIA once released a statement saying this mind control didn't work, but independent research turned up first-person witnesses who stated that classically conditioned MPD, multiple personality disorder or disassociative identity disorder, agents were at work within Cuba from the time of Castro's rise to power in the late 1950s. Okay, maybe this stuff is from Area 51 too, but when then does one make of the FBI interview with Ferry CAP cadet turned New Orleans cop Fred O'Sullivan on November 26, 1963? O'Sullivan told the FBI that Ferry might have had contact with Oswald at the Moissant Airport, CAP, and that according to the FBI report of this interview, Ferry had acquired a reputation for being able to hypnotize people and that he had once hypnotized a man following one of the CAP meetings. And there is a report re prepared by, by FBI agents in Los Angeles on December 2nd, 1963, referring to remarks made by Gene, Barnas, Barnett, Gene Barnes and NBC cameraman Barnes said Bob Mul Mulholland, NBC News Chicago, Dallas, Chicago talked in Dallas to one ferry, a narcotics addict now out on bail on a sodomy charge in Dallas. Ferry said that Oswald had been under hypnosis from a man doing a mind reading act at Ruby's Carousel. Ferry said to be a pri Ferry was said to be a private detective and the owner of an airline who took young boys on flights just for kids. Just for kicks. <sighs> Bob Mulholland will later become president of NBC News. Ferry, Ferry, F-E-R-R, it's a play on words, F-A-R-Y, meaning F-E-R-I-E, who did own an airline, United Air Taxi Service, will die a desperate man. Eddie Shearer brought the subject up himself. The hypnotism thing with David Ferry was the one thing about him that bothered me the most. One time I remembered we were marching in formation, drilling out at Lakefront Airport, getting ready to go to the CAP National Drill Competition, and this kid was twirling a Gideon, a metal thing, a fleur de lis on the top of the pole with the unit's colors and it got away from him and cut his hand up pretty good i mean a real deep gash and the kid gets up holding his hand and there is blood running down his arm past his elbow and david walks over to him and puts his hand out in front of the kid's face like he's giving him a stiff arm and says you will feel sensation but no pain sheer continued and then while we're all waiting for an ambulance to take the kid to the hospital, the kid is bleeding all over, but he's not in pain anymore. And then David goes over to him again and says to him, you will stop bleeding, and he did. Now, later when I was in the Air Force, sure, continued, I learned that this is all possible, that it can be done, but it can't be done with a subject unless you've been working hypnotically with that subject for a long period of time. You just can't walk over to someone, in other words, and tell them to stop bleeding. So it became clear to me that David Ferry had been working hypnosis with that kid for a long time without anyone knowing it. At least I had never heard of it before, and I spent a lot of time out there hanging around the airport. One of the earliest books on the Garrison Probe, Plot or Politics, by the two local New Orleans reporters, said David Ferry. He was a Civil Air Patrol leader for a number of years, and numerous persons have reported that he had the high school boys under his command then, and others 
in a later fairy formed outfit known as the Falcon Squadron, completely mesmerized. When CIA agent Richard Nagel was with Oswald in New Orleans, according to Dick Russell's book, The Man Who Knew Too Much, he discovered that Oswald was undergoing hypnotic therapy from David Ferry. Nagel dropped his potential bombshell in a single phrase in a letter in the 70s which included a set of cartoons, one sequence of which shows Oswald armed with a rifle. At the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository, when he suddenly awakens from a hypnotic trance, the, the House Assassinations Committee said that Ferry frequently practiced techniques of hypnosis on his young associates and the New Orleans police officers who discovered Ferry dead at his apartment in 1967 found several voluminous abstracts of po on post-hypnotic su suggestion as well as a whole library of books on hypnotism, all of which make more plausible the idea that the character assassination to which whistleblower Jack Martin was subjected might have had a very good reason. Jack may have been telling the truth. He told the FBI just three days after the assassination that he believed Ferry was an amateur hypnosis hypnotist who may have been capable of hypnotizing Oswald. Was Oswald manipulated through applications of mind control techniques? The notion seems fantastic, but the CIA and American military intelligence worked diligently for years on the manipulation of human behavior and on the creation of a Manchurian candidate. So the question hangs unanswered for the simple reason that no judicial review appears to have the power to compel truthful answers from those who know. The truth about the extent to which David Ferry used hypnotism during the course of his duties as a CIA agent and prototypical elite deviant will likely never be known. Author John, D. Dav John H. Davis, a member of the Board of Advisors of, of the Assassination Archives and Research Center in Washington, D.C., reported, for example, that a 30-page FBI report on Ferry is, whoops again, missing. Not to be outdone in withholding the truth from the American people, the CIA confessed in a 1975 Presidential Commission report that it had lost the 152 files concerning drug testing and a much larger program studying means for controlling human behavior, exploring the effects of radiation, electric shock, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, and harassment sub substances. Harassment substances? What the hell is that? An maybe something like scopolamine. An enormous number of documents about David Ferry remain unclassified until well after everyone reading this sentence is dead. But even back in 1958, there were people interested in what he was up to. Another thing I remembered back in 19, back in 58 and 59, states pilot Shearer was Dave would always warn us not to say anything on the phone we didn't want to have overheard. He was convinced his phone was tapped, and when it would pick up before dialing, he'd swear a blue streak onto it, as if he were talking to whoever was tapping his phone. During exactly this time period, there was also quite a bit of FBI interest in the young Barry Seal as well, according to Jerry Chidney, Chig, Chid, Chidgy, yes, Jerry Chidgy, who was Barry's roommate and friend. He became aware in the early nineteen in early nineteen sixty that the FBI was following Barry. When I met Barry, I owned the Amber Bottle, a fork a folk club in Baton Rouge. We were capitalizing on the folk craze, Chidgy recalls. And that was where Barry used to hang and we became good friends and ended up living together. And one day I remember two FBI guys showed up asking questions about him while Barry was gone on a trip. Another time that same year, 1960, I flew to Dallas and two men in black suits followed me there and back. And 
and the only reason I could ever figure was because of Barry said Chidgy, unless that is where they were making a practice surveillance folk club owners. Barry Seal and David Ferry share yet another highly unusual trait. We discovered a trait which is a big plus for any secret agent. Both men had photographic memories. When we interviewed David Ferry in Intimate and CIS at Leighton Mart Martins, he had attempted to dispel the belief that Ferry had been plotting the Kennedy assassination during the two weeks prior, while Ferry had been staying at Churchill Farms, Marcello's Louisiana countryside estate. Many have wondered why Marcello would have used a mere pilot on his legal team. David Ferry had a photographic memory, Martins told us. That's why Carlos used him. He was useful because he had sat down and memorized the Louisiana Napoleonic Code in six weeks in its entirety. Barry Seal went David Ferry Barry Seal went David Ferry one better. Barry not only had a photographic memory, his widow Debbie Seal says, but he was also able to read upside down. He could go into an office and sit in front of somebody's desk and while still carrying on a normal conversation, read what they had in front of them and remember it completely later. A photographic memory, the ability to surreptitiously read upside down, being as good a pilot as any alive, these are all clearly useful traits in the world of clandestine services, but they don't explain why the FBI was so interested in both David Ferry and Barry Seal. What were Seal and Barry doing which warranted FBI surveillance back in the early 60s? The answer opens what's been called an endless can of worms. And that's it for today's chapter. Pick up again tomorrow.